Liberty and Property by Ludwig von Mises. Chapter 5. Romantic philosophy labored under the illusion that in the early ages of history the individual is free, and that the course of historical evolution deprived him of his primordial liberty. As Jean-Jacques Rousseau saw it, nature accorded men freedom, and society enslaved him. In fact, primeval man was at the mercy of every fellow who was stronger and therefore could snatch away from him the scarce mean of subsistence. There is in nature nothing to which the name of liberty could be given. The concept of freedom always refers to social relations between men. True, society cannot realize the illusory concept of the individual's absolute independence. Within society, everyone depends on what other people are prepared to contribute to his well-being in return for his own contribution to their well-being. Society is essentially the mutual exchange of services. As far as individuals have the opportunity to choose, they are free. If they are forced by violence or threat of violence to surrender the terms of an exchange, no matter how they feel about it, they lack freedom. The slave is unfree precisely because the master assigns him his tasks and determines what he has to receive if he fulfills it. As regards the social apparatus of repression and coercion, the government, there cannot be any question of freedom. Government is essentially the negation of liberty. It is the recourse to violence or threat of violence in order to make all people obey the orders of government, whether they like it or not. As far as the government's jurisdiction extends, there is coercion, not freedom. Government is a necessary institution, the means to make the social system of cooperation work smoothly without being disturbed by violent acts on the part of gangsters, whether of domestic or of foreign origin. The government is not, as some people like to say, a necessary evil. It is not an evil, but a means, the only means available to make peaceful human coexistence possible. But it is the opposite of liberty. It is beating, imprisoning, hanging. Whatever a government does, it is ultimately supported by the actions of armed constables. If the government operates a school or a hospital, the funds required are collected by taxes, i.e., by payments exacted from the citizens. If we take into the account the fact that, as human nature is, there can neither be civilization nor peace without functioning of the government apparatus of violent action. We may call government the most beneficial human institution, but the fact remains that government is repression, not freedom. Freedom is to be found only in the sphere in which government does not interfere. Liberty is always freedom from the government. It is the restriction of the government's interference. It prevails only in the fields in which the citizens have the opportunity to choose the way in which they want to proceed. Civil rights are the statutes that precisely circumscribe the sphere in which the men conducting the affairs of state are permitted to restrict the individual's freedom to act. The ultimate end that men aim at by establishing government is to make possible the operation of a definite system of social cooperation under the principle of the division of labor. If the social system which people want to have is socialism, communism planning, there is no sphere of freedom left. All citizens are in every regard subject to orders of the government. The state is a total state. The regime is totalitarian. The government alone plans and forces everybody to behave according with this unique plan. In the market economy, the individuals are free to choose the way in which they want to integrate themselves into the frame of social cooperation. As far as the sphere of market exchange extends, there is a spontaneous action on the part of individuals. Under this system that is called laissez-faire, and which Ferdinand Lassalle dubbed as the night watchman state, there is freedom because there is a field in which individuals are free to plan for themselves. The socialists must admit there cannot be any freedom under a socialist system, but they try to obliterate the difference between servile state and economic freedom by denying that there is any freedom in the mutual exchange of commodities and services on the market. Every market exchange is, in the words of a school of pro-socialist lawyers, a coercion over the people's liberty. There is, in their eyes, no difference worth mentioning between a man's paying a tax or a fine imposed by a magistrate or his buying a newspaper or admission to a movie. In each of these cases, 
The man is subject to governing power. He is not free. For, as Professor Hale says, a man's freedom means the absence of any obstacle to his use of material goods. This means I am not free because a woman who has knitted a sweater, perhaps as a birthday present for her husband, puts an obstacle to my using it. I myself am restricting all other people's freedom because I object to their using my toothbrush. In doing this, I am, according to this doctrine, exercising private governing power, which is analogous to public government power. The powers that the government exercises in imprisoning a man in Sing Sing. Those expounding this amazing doctrine consistently conclude that liberty is nowhere to be found. They assert that what they call economic pressures do not essentially differ from the pressures that masters practice with regard to their slaves. They reject what they call private government power, but they do not object to the restriction of liberty by public government power. They want to concentrate all what they call restrictions of liberty in the hands of the government. They attack the institution of private property and the laws that, as they say, stand ready to enforce property rights, that is, to deny liberty to anyone to act in a way which violates them. A generation ago, all housewives prepared soup by proceeding in accordance with the recipes that they have got from their mothers or from a cookbook. Today, many housewives prefer to buy canned soup, to warm it, and to serve it to their family. But to say our learned doctors, the Canning Corporation is in a position to restrict the housewife's freedom because in asking for a price for the tin can, it puts an obstacle to her use of it. People who did not enjoy the privilege of being tutored by these eminent teachers would say that the canned product was turned out by the cannery and that the corporation in producing it removed the greatest obstacle to a consumer's getting and using the can, which it's non-existence. The mere essence of a product cannot gratify anybody without its existence, but they are wrong, say the doctors. The corporation dominates the household. It destroys by its excess concentrated power over her individual freedom, and it is the duty of the government to prevent such a gross offense. Corporations say, under the auspices of the Ford Foundation, another of this group, Professor Burl, must be subjected to the control of the government. Why does our housewife buy the canned product rather than cling to the methods of her mother and grandmother? No doubt because she thinks this way of acting is more advantageous for her than the traditional custom. Nobody forced her. There were people, they are called jobbers, promoters, capitalists, speculators, stock exchange gamblers, who had the idea of satisfying a latent wish of millions of housewives by investing in the cannery industry. And there are other equally selfish capitalists who, in many hundreds of other corporations, provide consumers with many hundreds of other things. The better a corporation serves the public, the more customers it gets, the bigger it grows. Go into the home of the average American family, and you will see for whom the wheels of the machines are turning. In a free country, nobody is prevented from acquiring riches by serving the consumers better than they are served already. What he needs is only brains and hard work. Modern civilization, nearly all civilization, said Edwin Cannon, the last in a long line of eminent British economists, is based on the principle of making things pleasant for those who please the market, and unpleasant for those who fail to do so. All this talk about the concentration of economic power is vain. The bigger a corporation is, the more people it serves, the more does it depend on pleasing the consumers, the many the masses, Economic power in the market economy is in the hands of the consumers. Capitalistic business is not the perseverance in the once attained state of production. It is rather ceaseless innovation, daily repeated attempts to improve the provision of the consumers by new, better, and cheaper products. Any actual state of production activities is merely transitory. There prevails incessantly the tendency to supplant what is already achieved by something that serves the consumers better. There is consequently under capitalism a continuous circulation of elites. What characterizes the men whom one calls the captains of industry is the ability to contribute new ideas and to put them to work. However big a corporation must be, it is doomed as soon as it does not succeed in adjusting itself daily anew to the best possible methods of serving the consumers. But the politicians and other would-be reformers see only the structure of industry as it exists today. 
they think that they are clever enough to snatch from business control the plants as they are today and to manage them by sticking to already established routines, while the ambitious newcomer, who will be the tycoon of tomorrow, is already preparing plans for things unheard of before. All they have in mind is to conduct affairs along tracks already beaten. There is no record of industrial innovation contrived and put into practice by bureaucrats. If one does not want to plunge into stagnation, a free hand must be left to those today unknown men who have the ingenuity to lead mankind forward on the way to more and more satisfactory conditions. This is the main problem of a nation's economic organization. Private property of the material factors of production is not a restriction of the freedom of all people to choose what suits them best. It is, on the contrary, the means that assigns to the common man, in his capacity as a buyer, supremacy in all economic affairs. It is the means to stimulate a nation's most enterprising men to exert themselves to the best of their abilities in the service of all the people.